Hello everyone, good afternoon and I've got the lovely job of welcoming you all, all 830 of you to the launch of our short film. It's all about relationships, embedding relational trauma sensitive approaches in education this afternoon. My name is Maureen McAteer and I'm an assistant director in Bernardo Scotland and I lead our partnership work with schools across the country. And it's a real privilege to be here today launching the film that we've created in partnership with Public Health Scotland. Our joint work on this first began well over a year ago and in response to some amazing work that we were seeing through our partnership work with schools across Scotland. And we also noticed that there was a shift more generally in education circles. And very much a deeper understanding of children's and young people's emotional needs were taking root in practice. So with Public Health Scotland, we wanted to celebrate and promote this growth of relational approaches using our role as national Scotland-wide organisations to spread this really, really positive message and to build confidence and momentum in our journey together to deliver the very best possible experiences and outcomes for our children and young people. Alongside this in Bernardo Scotland, we've also been calling for a national conversation about the health and wellbeing of education staff, exploring what needs to be in place for those of us who spend the highest amounts of time with children and young people, so that we also have access to high levels of support and to sustain us in the roles that we undertake. And as um, some of the staff in the film acknowledge, it can be really tough at time doing this job and that they need access to support too. The new situation that we now find ourselves in only magnifies the importance of the core messages of the film. In a world that can feel really, really scary and uncertain for children and young people, especially at the moment, maybe for some, it's crucial that we recognise the importance and the difference that every single one of us can make through our relationships with children and young people. So before we begin today, I've got a few practical issues I need to run through with you. Hope that's okay. Firstly, the webinar will run for one hour and it's been recorded. Therefore, anybody who was unable to sign up for today's webinar will be able to watch it later and we'll make sure that we communicate through social media when that link's available. The film itself and the accompanying film notes will be available immediately after the webinar today. And again, we'll post links on our social media to direct people to it. Once live, please share these with colleagues and others in your networks. The streaming quality of today's event will probably be a wee bit dependent on your individual internet connection. But as I've already mentioned, a high quality version of the film will be available to view immediately afterwards. The Q&A box is live, but as we have such a short time and such high numbers on you of, of you on the webinar today, um, we may not get to all of the questions. However, with our partners in Public Health Scotland, we're already looking at what other engagement we might need to have around this, and we'll be in touch with you in due course about that. You can join the discussion about the themes raised in today's webinar on Twitter using the hashtag NurtureTheNext, so please do that. Um, while you're watching the film, you can hide the panellist box by hovering your mouse at the top of the screen, clicking View Options and then hiding the video panel. Um, my wonderful colleague Sam is virtually by my side today, making sure everything runs as smoothly as possible. I think it's fair to say we have pretty much jumped in the deep end, never having hosted a webinar and certainly not with as many people as us before. So please, please bear with us if there's any technical issues. Um, after I finish my very brief introduction, we'll screen the film and then Lisa Cherry, our discussion host, will facilitate a conversation with our guest panellists, who are Erin McCauley and Patty Santelises. Lisa will be very well known to many of you, I'm sure. She brings extensive experience to this conversation from her long career in education and social care settings. Lisa has been a long time leading voice in calling for a radical transformation of how we work together and an advocate for relational and trauma informed approaches and we are absolutely delighted that she's going to be part of today's seminar. Erin McCauley is a recently qualified teacher now working for Stirling Council. Erin brings both professional and personal insight to the role teachers can play in the individual journeys of children and young people. Patty Santelises leads the work of the Health and Wellbeing Team in Edinburgh City Council, 
including the trailblazing one in five child poverty work and a range of other really creative initiatives promoting wellbeing and resilience. We're really, really grateful to Lisa, to Erin and to Patty for giving their time today and sharing their insights about how we navigate the current challenges while keeping a focus on the wellbeing of children, young people and staff. So thank you very much to Lisa and to Erin and to Patty. Before we commence the screening, I'd also like to thank all the staff and pupils in Craigton Primary, St Hilary's Primary and Falkirk High for their participation in the film. They've really brought the issues to life for us and um, given loads of food for thought about how we might translate that into our own context. Special thanks also to Elaine Patterson and Carly Grant from Public Health Scotland, who jointly developed this resource with us, and also to Angus from Media Education. Thank you very much to all of you. And finally, a big thank you to my Bernardo Scotland colleagues, Hazel Russell and Nikki Lawrence. I uh, really hope you enjoy the film and you're able to use it to support and strengthen relational practice in your context, wherever or whatever that is. And we'll commence the screening and then Lisa will take it from there. So thank you very much. Hope you enjoy everybody. It's all about relationships. Embedding relational trauma-sensitive approaches in education. In partnership, Bernardo Scotland and Public Health Scotland ask those working in education, what makes a difference to children and young people's mental health and wellbeing? We heard lots of wonderful insights and it's clear from our conversations there is an overwhelming desire to nurture all children and young people's mental health and wellbeing. We heard the importance of being aware of the impact of adversity, trauma, poverty and the many other factors that can make life tough for children. However, there was an appreciation that all children and young people's mental health must be nourished and nurtured. We believe school staff are experts in doing this and have the power to create and foster a culture of warmth, nurture, kindness and positive relationships within their school environments. Nurture, respect, compassion, safety and rights are all key components of trauma-sensitive and relational practice and are vitally important in how we respond to and are with our children and young people. In this film, we're not presenting anything new. Instead, we're pulling together lots of words, terms and ideas and asking the question, what's relational practice all about and what does that mean for me and my practice? We believe to be trauma-informed is to focus on relationships, to be nurturing, to be compassionate, to be rights-respecting, to acknowledge the impact of adversity and trauma, to build resilience and to care deeply about children and young people's mental health and well-being. These are the foundations to building good quality relationships. So what does make a difference to children and young people's mental health and well-being? We believe it's relationships which are at the heart of creating environments which support good mental health and well-being for our children and young people. We feel it's time to celebrate the positive relational work shared by colleagues making a difference to children and young people across Scotland. We've become increasingly interested in children and young people's mental health and wellbeing in education settings. Time and time again, we heard actions and approaches being described as simple things. Things like consistently providing a warm welcome when they arrive at school, always using their names, using compassionate language, being really interested and inquisitive in their lives and how they're doing. So it was apparent that what was being described was wonderful examples of relationally informed trauma sensitive practices. The stuff that helps children feel included, safe, nurtured, respected. So while it might feel simple to people, it might look simple on the surface, actually we know that quality relationships change lives. Chapter 1. Building strong relationships. Trauma-informed and trauma-responsive systems acknowledge that every interaction is an intervention. Dr Karen Treisman. We don't know who might need that extra bit of kindness towards them. What's important is that everybody coming into our school feels welcomed, feels included, feels loved. 
Being trauma sensitive doesn't mean looking out for trauma in every child. Being trauma sensitive is about having wonderful relationships with everyone in our school community. Trauma sensitive is in the first instance about understanding how someone feels, but it's also about enabling people to discuss how they feel and hopefully to promote change in how they deal with how they feel. In terms of education in particular, trauma sensitive for me draws in an aspects of children's rights, it draws in the nurture principles. It's actually just being this nurturing, rights-based, central approach to everything. It's not about specific interventions, it's just about an approach about who you are. Teachers listen to you. Whatever you say, they care. If a teacher has a different opinion, they still listen to you. They will always smile at you and say hi to you. They are genuinely interested. I know myself, even as a member of staff, if a pupil says to me, oh, hello, Mrs. Connington, it brightens up my day. I feel much better. I feel included and I feel valued. And it's the, it's the same, it's reciprocal. If I do that for a pupil, then they feel that I want them here. And, and that's true, I do want them in the school. You know, smile, engage, listen to them, take an interest in them. When things aren't going well, stay calm for them. She'll come over, she'll see what's wrong, you can tell her. If I'm annoyed, I'll usually go down, sit in the lunch hall for a wee bit, she'll come down and she'll get me. And then we'll go into her room, have a talk, what's been going on. She just asked me, how are you doing and all that. And is that important? Aye. Why is it important? Because you don't want to come to school all miserable and angry. Whenever I used to, I always come to school, but I used to never go to my classes. What's changed about you since you started coming? I'm always at school, I'm always in here, and I'm trying to stay out of trouble. We don't need to be a therapist to be therapeutic and understand when someone else is hurting or when they're struggling. So it doesn't need to be complex language. It looks to me like you're having a tough time just now. Do, you know, do we need to have a discussion later? What do you need from me at this moment? Some simple things just about human connection and caring. If you have any problems at home, you can also talk to them about that. It's just the way they are. Chapter 2. Reframing and modelling behaviour. See a child differently and you'll see a different child. Dr Stuart Shanker. Showing the children positive interactions with other adults is very, very important. And it is maybe a skill that we can't assume that our children are learning that we have to model and um, teach them as well. How I respond to the behaviour is about me modelling what someone should do in that instance. And if all that child or adult has seen is something that's not helpful when they present with this behaviour, then it's not going to make any difference to them, it's not going to help. It's not even choice, sometimes they've been forced into a particular way of behaving because they are so distressed that they, they find it difficult to act in any other way. And I think now that we've reframed the way in which we look at things and how we use certain terms, actually it's changed the whole culture. People are more understanding, more caring. And as a result, the behaviour here has changed drastically. It's so much better. With staff conversations like, um, I can't teach this child, exclude this child, take this child out of my class, we don't get them so much anymore, in fact we very seldom get them and that's to do with staff and having a greater uh, understanding, uh, I, I think, of the circumstances these young people bring. You know, I've been in the, the profession for 34 years, I haven't always thought like that. Uh, it's taken me a long time to come to this realisation that the kinds of things that we are talking about now and trying to implement now in the school are absolutely crucial. They are all our young people and it is up to us to change and to work differently and to understand better so that we can support every young person. We're trying to build children for the future. We're trying to make a difference over that long time. So we need to be prepared that some of the things we're doing will take that time, such as developing empathy, such as showing by how we behave, what we expect them to do. Schools may have values. We expect respect. You're going to need to explain that to children. What does that mean? We expect good listening. What does that look like? Tell them what you do want, not what you don't want. So you have to have the expectations. You also need to have the consistency that one person or an adult is going to say the same as the next adult. It creates that sense of safety. Chapter 3. 
creating a safe environment and a positive culture. When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. Alexander Denhauer. What we felt and saw for ourselves was going into schools who really pride themselves on good quality relationships. It's a culture, it's an ethos, it's felt across the whole school environment. The values have been here since ages and ages ago, when everybody's new to the school, through time they learn what they are and why we have them. We took the conscious decision to change and we organised it into three strands or th uh, three different aspects of the work. Um, the first of these was changing the provision which refers to the curriculum and the support mechanisms that are in place for young people. The second of these was about changing the capacity which was about uh, upskilling their own staff, enhancing their understanding of the difficulties that young people face and of uh, trauma-informed practice. The last part of the change was about changing the mindset. I think the ethos uh, is completely different. Um, you can see it, you can feel it, you listen to the feedback that you get from pupils and from staff. It's, a, a, I think, a, a happier, I think there's a nurturing feel to it. I think there's a supportive feel to it. It's just a much calmer place. If we're looking at trauma-sensitive approaches, there are layers. And one of the very first layers is about um, a safe environment so that children know they've got those base needs met and a supportive environment so they know where to go if something does upset them. We were looking at safe breakout spaces for the children who were maybe needing a little time out from class. So they now have um, some time out cards and we have safe spaces that you'll see as you wander around the school for them to go to um, with uh, a worry monster so that they can put worries into the worry monster's mouth or some calm colouring. Having the facility where they can take themselves out of the situation for a lot of time. They all have safe spaces that they know what they can do if things are going that way. Then that in itself, which is very simple, it makes a big difference to them. You'll notice as you wander around the school as well that we've looked at children's rights and that's been very much a focus for us. The minions around the school will show you the children's rights which we visit at assembly, we visit um, during curriculum time as well because it's part of the health and wellbeing curriculum. Pupils are becoming more aware about what their rights are um, and I think they are ready to kind of talk about that and say, well, actually, I do have a right to feel safe. I do have a right to be included. Um, and what I particularly like um, about Falkirk High at the moment is we're looking at those rights and we're trying to fit it into what's suitable for each individual. Because although there's the overarching, you do have a right to these things, feeling safe, healthy, achieving, so on. It's how we do that that's important. We do a sort of daily check-in just to catch up and give them that time to chat and express how they're feeling. We'll look at different emotions and help them understand the impact the emotions have on your body and that they do change from day to day. From a teaching perspective, you're very much driven by the curriculum and um, making sure you're getting through all your coursework and assessments and whatnot. But in here, it's kind of almost like taking a step back and going back to those core foundation skills that maybe our young people haven't experienced as they've been grown up. I like how the staff are really friendly and I wouldn't like to go to another school. We all look through our eyes in a different way because we've had different experiences and how I might address something is very different from how a pupil would. And a lot of the time it's about being able to self-regulate so these pupils don't necessarily know, actually I'm really angry and agitated, I'll just take a moment and breathe. They don't know that that's something that they need to do in order to slow their heart rate, calm down. It really is the, the absolute simplest of things that we do there, and it's, it's something that's very difficult to measure but it's in our interactions with each other, it's in smiling, it's in being welcoming, it's in giving children hugs. All the small things add up, it's recognising each person as an individual. So it has to involve everyone, not just the whole school approach, it has to be a community approach. Chapter 4 Supporting staff, health and well-being. You can't pour from an empty cup. Staff well-being is vitally important. We know that to give care, you've got to look after yourself and care for yourself and care for the other caregivers who are around you. Supporting those young people and trying to get them to fulfil their potential is a tough job. And you need great personal resilience to be able to deal with that. So it's an obvious one, really, if our staff are not in a place in terms of their own health and well-being, um, their own resilience, uh, their own self-esteem, all of that, if they're not in a good place with regard to that, how can they adequately support or appropriately support highly vulnerable 
young people. It's a really open environment here. I never, ever think twice about seeing how I'm feeling. And I think creating that culture and that kind of ethos where you'll not be judged on, it's not a reflection on your ability as a teacher. This is life, you know, we all have ups and downs. It's okay to say, I've had a bad day and just be really open with how you're feeling. I have to be mindful of my staff's health and well-being. So that has involved organising different training for them, looking at their own mindfulness, um, looking at coping with their own anxieties. And I suppose it's about the wee things that you do as well. It's maybe about putting a chocolate bar on the desk with a wee positive message. Grown-ups like compliments just as much as the young people. Staff health and wellbeing is fundamentally important to this. Before you can have a safe environment for children, before you can create that support for them, before you can teach them the skills for the future, staff need to feel safe and supported and they need to feel like they have the skills so it's about leadership being aware that staff perhaps need emotional check-ins staff needs time we have introduced them um, for staff wellbeing sessions now they are not um, extras they are in place of what would have previously been a meeting about curriculum or a meeting about whatever uh, agenda we had on the go at the time so we are hoping um, that these changes will uh, have a positive impact on staff health and well-being, but also the morale and the ethos in the school. We would like people to think about the relationships they have with the children they work with and what could they do to increase the quality of those relationships or what are they already doing that is great and that they should really celebrate and share that with their colleagues. We see this as a whole school approach, um, as a whole system approach. We would like to see a shift and I think it's about taking a bit of time, a little bit of time to reflect and to think about the relationships they have with the children they work with, the adults they work with. and every day to just remind themselves of the importance of relationships in terms of helping children achieve their potential and also helping themselves to feel good about the work that they do. Hello. Hi. Am I just like meant to launch in? Is that what's meant to happen? As the yeah, host, that's, you, that's, 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 that's you, Lisa, on your door. <laughs> okay. Well, it's really lovely to be here. Um, and I hadn't quite appreciated I needed to dive straight in there. So big apologies, <laughs> to everybody, as I waited for the other host to come. Um, what a powerful film and so good to um, see all of those themes that many of us are talking about all the time. And I was watching that film very much thinking about the context of COVID-19 as well and how creative we're going to have to be um, to really work with some of those. I, I, I watched a hug and I'm quite obsessed with hugs. Um, but I'll get you to introduce yourself and then perhaps we can um, have a look at, at, at hugs and all the different creative ways that we're going to think about how we have those nurturing spaces when we're losing that, that small element there um, that can feel quite a big element for some. So as panel host, um, what did you think of the film? What did you think? I mean, what, what, what was it like for you watching that? 
you want me to start? Yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> okay. So I'm Patty Santelises. Um, I'm probably quite relieved that I can't see 800 faces right now. Um, and I work in City of Edinburgh Council and have been for like 14 years um, working with an amazing team trying to promote positive mental health and emotional well-being and resilience through a range of different programs. And I just felt like this video, what Bernardo's have tried to do with this video is, is really celebrate the fact that for so many years, I would say 14 years now, the focus for Scottish education has been on relationships, on nurture, on respect. And I think that for many people, like the video said, this isn't going to be something new. This is something that many people have been working towards. Um, and trauma, being sensitive to, to trauma is, is a part of that, but it won't be something new. And I think, you know, I work mainly with East, West, Middle Ovian, Scottish Borders and Edinburgh, and I totally shout out to all of them for all the amazing work that they're already doing. We saw Falkirk there illustrated in the video, and I know that all across Scotland, people should be feeling very proud that this is really a celebration of um, our relational practice work um, rather than anything new. So I hope some of you felt very proud just watching that and knowing that what you observed in that video are things that you're probably already doing in your setting. Yeah, and what about what, what, because you're, you're a new teacher, aren't you? Hello, yeah, my name's Erin and I am a new teacher. So for me, the video was incredibly powerful and it was really inspiring. Um, for me as well, it's actually, re it resonates a lot with my personal experience. So, um, you know, I got really involved in, in children's rights and came into the profession because of my own experience of my teachers saved my life. And for me, um, I didn't have a stable adult in my life that I could depend on and my teachers became that sort of um, almost like a family to me. They became the people that um, were always there, that were stable, that were checking in, that were nurturing and, and those what has been labelled as simple things really had a massive impact on, on transforming my life personally. Um, so I suppose that I'm in a quite a unique position that I'm not very long out of, of the school system. I'm a new teacher and and I'm seeing things from both sides of, of maybe being the young person um, experiencing trauma and adversity and now um, as a professional seeing it in a, in a different setting. So mm -hmm. I think the powerful, the, the video is so important. Um, before um, this pandemic that we're all living in, it was incredibly important. Um, and just to give staff a bit of confidence and in, in their capabilities and in, in themselves and, and to help equip them and understand that their role is so important and I think you know teachers are not just teachers and, and no one's expecting this profession to be um, mental health professionals or social workers but they have such a massive impact on young people's life um, and I think this video will help a lot of teachers feel equipped to support young people even further um, mm. and I, I think that if we're not getting it right for young people's mental health and well-being then we can't get it right for anything else. I think you raise I mean you raise such a vital point really and it's one of the challenges which is that it can be incredibly difficult to really deeply understand the impact of the relationships and potential that teachers can have if people have always had those very stable relationships outside of school. So if you have those very stable relationships outside of school and school isn't great, it's not the end of the world because you go back to those very stable, secure relationships. The challenge, of course, is that if you're someone who doesn't have those, and there's lots of children for lots of different reasons um, that don't have those, then those relationships in school become incredibly important. And that can be quite a difficult message to convey because even though those, you're right to highlight that they might look like very simple messages, but if it was as simple as it looked, everyone would be doing it and everyone isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we're, and, and you, Patricia, was, were talking about the length of time that we've been working towards this. I mean, I, 
I've been at this for 30 years and some, you know, uh, as a child and an adult. <laughs> and, um, you know, I feel like I'm very much part of a wave of change, but I'm also very aware that some of the fights stay the same. Some of the challenges stay the same. Some of the things that we have to do to try and create change, the noise we have to make, I'm not working any less. I'm not having less conversations. Mm -hmm. I'm having more conversations. I'm having more um, challenges in, in, in really trying to be part of this wave that so many of us are, which is, which is brilliant, you know. Mm. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if, if you were going to ask a question there or not, but I'm I not that, that you're right to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that you're right that one of the things that would be helpful, although this video wasn't um, meant to be COVID specific, um, but um, my team are at the moment just putting together sort of uh, training for staff within our local authority about thinking about transitioning back to school and how to support yourself you know that idea that you can't pour from an empty cup as well as how do we support our children and young people and it is a very it's a massively uncertain time for everybody and i think it was really interesting because we were just talking this morning and saying that some of the research says that the most important things that we need to have clear after a pandemic is we need to be really clear on the practical the practical arrangements and um and that is something that's really important a lot of people have many questions because we actually do not know what is our world going to look like what are our environments going to look like how is it all going to work but then that's something that we can't work on we can't think about too much at the moment because we're not sure but what we can do something about and what we and what this film is all about is the one thing that we have control over is ourselves. So the relationship that we are the resource that we can bring relationships, no matter what the environment will look like, is something that I feel like how this film could be used in that sense of reminding people it's that quality relationships, like Erin was saying, quality relationships do change lives. And if we know that despite what our circumstances and our environment might look like and even how it's all going to work practically knowing that we are the relationship we can make a difference in the way that we're interacting and it brings us back to basics what what do the people look like who are the ones that change our lives and those characteristics are things that we can be working on at this time even even with so much uncertainty so mm. that was just sort of a a way of thinking about how it's related this video can be useful even in times of uncertainty or especially in times of uncertainty perhaps and drawing upon that knowledge of people who have experienced and recovered from adversity is a huge um, pot of um, wisdom about what helped people what supported people um, what enabled people to to move through really difficult times. And I think what we would find is the practical stuff is really, it has a place, but if those relationships aren't there, then, then it's, I think it's very lost. It's a very lost, uh, it mm -hmm. would be lost on you if you're just on your own trying to make sense of, of what's going on. And there's, there's no anchor, there's no other human to draw upon and to uh, connect with. So, um, so going into your new school, have you have you start have you started yet this year? I mean, what a time to become a new teacher! You know that that really kind of dawned on me this morning. I was running a training session about actually post pandemic nurture, and I was think I, I gave a nod to. Um, all the teachers just starting so all the new head teachers and all the new teachers just starting school during this time i mean how are you making sense of all that yeah so I, i'm just coming to the end of my probation year so it's um mm -hmm. it's certainly been interesting um 
I don't think anybody could prepare for this and especially my subjects modern studies and history you know it's I don't even think I can there's no point in making a resource at the moment and um, just keeps going out of date so yeah it's certainly an interesting time um, I think everybody will be feeling even as staff a bit anxious on going back and I think what that video highlighted as well is that before um, we feel comfortable to to support young people we've also got to feel supported in our mental health and well-being and um, I think that that video also highlights that there's so many amazing things going on all across the country um, and that has to be celebrated and shared and, and embedded in every school not just pockets of the country and you know every school should be um, insp hopefully be inspired by that video um, but again yeah the video really touches on that before we start you know supporting young people's mental health we've also got to feel supported and and it is again as the video touched on it's it's about a whole not just a whole school but a whole community and um, I think that's the way forward even coming out of this pandemic as well it's got to be a whole community approach um, so I yes the video did that really well actually I felt that the it, in terms of really understanding how because it's not just I, I get very frustrated with the whole self-care language because it's, you can have the best kind of self-care in the world but if you don't work in an environment where you can go and have your lunch you know it's all a little bit academic really isn't it if you don't if you don't work in a culture that ensures that you have the space to take care of yourself then it's 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 uh it places the onus onto you in impossible circumstances and i felt that the video actually uh, is one of the first attempts that I think I've seen in that way that starts to really unpick and understand how you embed that into a culture mm -hmm. um, and ensure that everyone has feels safe enough to care for their own needs and to express them. That's something that isn't, uh, you know, need, it's not passive. It's not something that will happen by accident. It has to be made space for. Mm -hmm. I do think that you're right that um, we actually do need to be explicit in a lot of things. You know, it, mm, it's great sometimes for things to happen organically, but I think that the real push and the drive from government all the way down has been like this actually has to be explicit. We have to be seeing it in school development plans. We have to be, you know, the focus, obviously, health and wellbeing is right up there with numeracy and literacy. And I think that's, that's great that we've got things so explicit and 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 the same goes for I think in the video it talks about you know how do children know what good listening looks like or what good friendship looks like if we're not explicitly teaching it and the building resilience resource that's you know that our primary schools have been using has has actually tried to pull together all the different best practice around there around social and emotional skill development because after several years of working in this field and several years of fabulous staff training and I know that the staff were being nurturing and kind and responsive I know that but it was really interesting that as children were hitting secondary schools they were saying we don't know how to look after our mental health because it hadn't been explicitly taught and now that we're actually talking about um, through the use of the metaphor of the river of life um, just trying to actually explicitly teach children that these there are ways that we can support our own mental health and well-being and that does make a, a big difference because like you say subtly it's great that we're compassionate we're welcoming we're using their names and they feel safe and secure in school for learning which is really really fundamental but in order for them to develop these skills as adults to look after their own health and well-being then we do also need to be explicitly teaching them to to the children as well and you saw examples of that on the video and i think that um our latest unit, which we obviously didn't have a clue that there was going to be a pandemic, but was called Expect the Unexpected. Um, and obviously, you know, you now kind of think that couldn't be more timely because it really was Expect the Unexpected um, in these months. But if we have tools and if we have built resilience, like the video mentions, then, you know, we will be able to put resources in place around us as well as whatever personal resilience we might have in order to help us to meet the challenges that we're currently going through and the ones that we will face when we return to um, whatever education might look like. 
So I think it's true about it's, it's not enough just to be subtle about it. We probably do need to be a bit more explicit. And with adults too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't make the assumption that adults understand either how to take care of themselves or feel comfortable doing so. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that one of the things I do um, think around taking care of yourself is that it's, it can be quite complicated if you've grown up in a family where it's not okay to do that or it's considered selfish or it's considered um, a luxury and you've grown up around that narrative, it can be very difficult to alter that way of being, that way of thinking. So as, as explicit as we need to be with children, adults need to have that too so that, that they have those opportunities. And I would just like to say to people, please put some stuff in the Q&A because I'm going to go to the Q&A in about four minutes. So if you've mm -hmm. got some questions that you'd like to ask, please, um, please pop them in there and then I'll, um, I'll start um, reading through them. I think there's also a fear sometimes that maybe teachers are scared to get it wrong, especially if, you know, they might fear things like adversity or getting into complex needs that, that children are facing. I think there's definitely a shift on people acknowledging um, what a lot of young people are dealing with. But I think there is maybe a bit of fear and resistance from some teachers that there's, they care so much that they're scared to get it wrong. Um, and I think hopefully again, that this video gives teachers the confidence that you know they can um, have a big impact and they can play a positive role and um, but yeah I think there is maybe a culture that teachers maybe are just scared to get it wrong for that for that young person and would rather maybe not enter that territory than get it wrong for them yeah yeah and you know we want to be working in ways that don't add to harm mm -hmm. we want to be working in ways that seek to support people healing from it and um and uh yeah i think you're absolutely right uh there is an anxiety we've heard that play out a lot i think mm -hmm. with teachers saying things like, i'm not a therapist i'm you know i'm not a mental health specialist um and actually i think the video works really hard at conveying those messages yeah. that uh, connection having a connection with somebody the stuff we opened up with really mm -hmm. is where that where the magic can be mm -hmm. I think as well just talking on the connection that it's not always going to be the guidance teacher or the people support teacher and you know young people connect with different people and um, you know for me it wasn't necessarily my, my people support teacher that I connected with and I think it's important that um, whoever that young person has of course the class teacher is important but that young person might have a great connection with the janitor or they mm -hmm. might have a really good connection with the cook and they have to be included in that whole school approach and um, because it should be about that young person who they have the best relationship with and obviously things will get um, shifted over to pupil support or child protection or whoever has that role but if that young person's got a connection with someone that maybe isn't their class teacher or isn't pupil support that sh relationship should be should be nourished as well um so they've got to be included everybody has, has got to be a whole mm. school approach mm -hmm. and beyond the school gates as yeah. well you know because you're absolutely right i think you know one of the projects that we work on is called turn your life around and it includes people like yourself who have come from quite you know, substantial adversity. And when we try and unpick what were their risk factors, what were their protective factors and, and, you know, key people in their lives who made such a difference, you know, a teacher who would frame the pictures that one of our volunteers would draw, would draw. And, you know, now looking back, like you say, it's, people get scared, but it probably many of the teachers that made a difference, you didn't even know they were your life-changing people mm -hmm. and um and it's the same here like the one one of our volunteers talks shares a story about coming back in to the classroom and seeing her picture framed and on the wall and 
you know, just feeling so proud of that because that sort of thing never happened at home. Mm -hmm. So it was just like a tiny little thing. And um, others talk about youth workers who took a real interest in them. And then for like one whole year, they're, they're, they're not in any trouble. They're doing really well, but then the youth worker changes. And these are things that happen in life, but the stories that pop out are of kindness, actually, not of being a social worker, not of being a therapist. It's, mm -hmm. it's literally kindness, random acts of kindness to, to children that have maybe not experienced that much kindness and that much consistency. And, you know, sometimes it's almost humbling how little, how small the difference was, you know, how small the, inter the, the kind of interaction was. And I think that's the point of one of the points of the video and Dr. Karen Treisman and other people like that who are saying every interaction can can be an intervention or you don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic and and i think sometimes it's when we forget that we can make a difference that we do make a difference in all our interactions that we and we think what we do isn't important perhaps maybe like some of the people you mentioned like the jannies or the you know people thinking well what difference do i make but people make a massive difference on other people for the positive or the negative and it's when we forget that we make a difference that, that things go wrong. I think if we can hold on to the idea that every day we don't know who, who by being kind, it might help. Um, I, and obviously, there's no doubt about it. The children that are being talked about in the video and even maybe shown on the video are maybe not the easiest. Like nobody's saying this is easy. But as Lisa said at the beginning, the, those are the children that need you more. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's not easy it's actually it's easy to exclude it's easy to isolate it's easy to blame individuals and name them as mad bad or sad what's hard actually is building cultures that have relationships at the heart of them that seek to create a difference not just for the children in front of them but in the communities that they live and take some kind of stance about um the political climate that we live in uh, in terms of the um, things that people have to endure that do not support and help. Um, all the teachers with the best will in the world in a school can make a massive difference, but if they're operating in a, in a political climate that does not support the well-being and nurturing of children and families, then we know where that all ends up. Um, but I don't want to steer us into that murky, mucky place of um, <laughs> politics for too long because we have some questions. So I've picked a question here because I think it's really good. It came up this morning. Uh, so many of the positive nurturing, and this is Tanya Peters. So thank you, Tanya. So many of the positive nurturing relationships that we had established with pupils in our school have been negatively affected by not actually seeing them. Their lack of access to technology uh, which incidentally was meant to be rectified uh, and has been very slow to be so. Um, and, lo and I don't live in Scotland, so I must add that. So I'm speaking um, about um, promises that came from Westminster regarding technology and access um, and low engagement. It's a real worry that we'll have lost some of them. What are the two or three main priorities that you'd suggest senior leadership teams focus on in the first three to six months when we return to help rebuild those relationships? Which one of you would like to take that? I go first. Um, I think that's a great question. I think, to be honest, it's a concern of majority of teachers that um, they will be worried about their young people and maybe, you know, even if they are communicating virtually, it's not the same. Um, that's why I believe that when we do go back, that this video and the discussion that we're having is so important. We've got to reset almost and um, reset ourselves as, as teachers and also um, make sure that we are focusing on wellbeing and the mental health of young people and focusing on building relationships before, of course, everybody is going to be worried about the learning gap as well and the attainment gap, but personally, I, I do believe that when we go back, building those relationships by starting with wellbeing um, has got to be the priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I, um, again, I feel kind of lucky that we are in a local authority that's already made that clear that 
the, the emphasis has to be on building relationships back up again, um, rather than focusing just on closing the, the learning gap, which is going to be really difficult um, to do as time goes on. But I think kind of three things I would say is, I think that senior management teams are going to have to ensure that their staff feel safe and supported so that they're in the best place to support others. And I think that means for everybody, my second point would be sharing stories. We need to provide space for reflection to share people's experiences, you know, and we need to also remember, and I think this is really important, that it's not all been negative, that for some children, um, it's been a really positive experience. For families, it's been a really positive experience. In fact, the Children's Parliament survey that came out recently was saying that, you know, for 80 plus kids, this has been you know, actually a good experience, just in the little conversations we've had with children, their number one thing they're getting is more time with their family. And that's their positive, you know, it's going to be also difficult for some children who have found it much easier to learn from a distance because they've got, they're in chronic pain, or they're highly anxious. They've actually found maybe this remote learning a little bit easier than going to mm -hmm. school. So I think that the third thing I would say is to be sure that we acknowledge that everybody might have had different experiences we don't need to assume that maybe these children have had a negative experience because of their environment equally we need to not assume that staff have been fine because you know they've been employed because we don't know what's happened with their partners or their their parents and who's been ill and so i think maybe that idea of um you know, focus on, on health and well-being, provide a platform to share stories and just be really empathic and understanding that everybody's experience will, will be different. But I do want to add that I think that having some real clear practical understanding will alleviate a lot of anxiety for people as well, just in terms of these are the parameters we're working in, then how do we emotionally respond in a nurturing way will be much easier to answer if we've got the first bit right. So those would be my thoughts. Brilliant. And my two penneth would be if we focus on safety, belonging and dignity. If we focus on those three things, anything that comes out of that that's underpinned by that, you can't go far wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Shanks, brilliant film. What was great about it was the idea that nurture is a culture rather than an intervention about seemingly small things that add up to real genuine relationships. How do we go about embedding that throughout schools? So it's not just an approach for some young people, but a way we all work. Great question. I'm loving all your questions, people. Who would like to take that? Erin? Do you, want, do you want me to take it? I'll just, I mean, how do we make it an approach the way that we all do things um, is the perennial question. Like Lisa said, she's been working in this for 30 years and, and us and, and many others. And um, it is, I think we might have an opportunity, to be honest, because I think unlike your usual start of a school year or, you know, people coming back after holidays, you know, where people just get on and do what they always have done. I think that this potentially is an opportunity. People are going to be coming in saying, coming back to school, this is going to be quite a big life change for everybody. And as such, we might be for the first time ever in a position where everybody is going to be saying the focus has to be health and well-being on relationships, on providing safe spaces, like you say, sense of meaning and belonging. And, and we've been, on one hand, we've been very technically connected but socially distanced and spending that time, because we know social support is so fundamental to our well-being. spending time building back up social support, community support, uh, family support. And, you know, that is going to be uh, a really, really important thing. But maybe we are in a better position than we've ever been before because everybody's coming into school almost with slightly new eyes. And that's probably never happened before so this is I would say this is actually an opportunity to embed the approach or embed an approach to to being a supportive kind empathic compassionate culture I hope you're right I hope you're right I'm seeing um 
uh, there's, that's, there's still a broad spectrum in England, I'm seeing. Uh, mm. I don't know what things are like up in Scotland, but I'm still seeing very distinctively different approaches that have been quiet and calm for a few weeks. And now coming back up with this, uh, trying to go, this idea that we're going back, when we go back, as if we're going back to something that's the same, we're going back to the way we were, the, this, this lack of understanding that we've changed, that actually mm -hmm. things have changed, we have changed, um, and we're going into something new and into something different, and you, I think you're spot on, we have an opportunity, uh, it's going to be about taking it. I'm going to do another question for you, Erin, because you didn't get one in there, because um, we've only got five more minutes. So, Erin, how do you feel about this? In returning <laughs> post-pandemic, this is from Claire McNichol, how do you think we can facilitate the connections and relationships from a distance? So in our return post-pandemic, how do you think we can facilitate? Maybe that question is about how how you have been facilitating the connections and relationships and I think so is it, does the question mean because we because of the social distancing is that what is being asked I don't understand the question so I'm going to rewrite the question okay. and I'm going to say <laughs> I'm going to say how have you facilitated the connections and relationships from a distance I think that's a good question okay um I think it's been very challenging I, it's not Personally, I have felt that relationships are definitely not the same on a, on a virtual platform, which really has shown me how important, you know, human connection is. And I think we're all um, adapting to this new virtual platform. And it is, I think, some people can take things differently um, when it's an email or it's you know you're posting in Google Classroom or something like that. Um, I'd like uh, all teachers have tried um, to communicate the best possible way and on the virtual platforms that we have but it is incredibly challenging and um, I think it, again it's the language that you use or um, I don't even know we small things like I always like to put a smiley face because I think sometimes if I'm putting up a task, it can just look very blunt um, mm. and not very nurturing or very welcoming if it's just signed off by Miss Macaulay. So I've tried to um, make things a bit more interactive and um, this week being Mental Health Awareness Week as well, I've put you know a wee calendar up of things that the kids can do. But I think, to be honest, um, I don't have the answer to the question. I think it's a big, big challenge. Um, and a lot of things have got to come from from leadership as well. Um, that we're working just... on together, aren't we? We are having to yeah. work on it together. And I'm going to stop you. Yeah. So I want one more question in, and it's a really good one. It's probably a bit of a hot one to leave us in our last few minutes. But this is Terry. Terry Gallagher's put, a whole school approach is obviously great, but many of our young people don't go to school or miss a lot of it. Should we go for a whole community approach to catch those ones, which we're all going, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what role do men have? There are very few seen today. And, and that came up this morning and it comes up in any training thing that I do because this, this clearly seems to me to be women's work. There's always a very small amount of men, uh, sometimes one man in a room of every 50. And this morning I had 220 people on a training event and there were six, six men uh so yeah i think that's a really valid question i absolutely believe that as a community approach i've always believed that that you've got to work with all the organizations and you've, it has to be a community approach and i think the point about men is is so important as well that mm -hmm. perhaps for um young girls or, or women that m maybe we talk about their emotions more and maybe if you if you're a, a young woman at school that you've been more willing to maybe show signs that you're upset or just or talk I, I don't think we're there yet with young men and and we've got to have positive male role models um that are that can encourage particularly young boys to to speak about how they're feeling and and have those positive male role models in their life so I think that mm -hmm. point is, is absolutely crucial 
Um, I agree. And all there's brought it up as well. Someone else has mm -hmm. just put three female speakers, though one in the brilliant film. Do you find this a gendered wave of change? Also bearing in mind a lot of trauma is from male violence or are the men fully on board? It's not an issue. We don't have time to get into it. <laughs> it's four o'clock and it's the end of the conversation. But I think if, if there's anything that's come up um, that's left is that there are 46 questions in here that we've been unable to answer. And I hope that um, Bernardo's are able to take those questions. I'm certainly interested in having a look at those questions and thinking about how we can continue the conversation using those questions as a thread for us to um, deepen what it is we're talking about, be reflective, be um, questioning of everything and make sure that we're always, always uh, seeking not to add to harm, but rather to support people healing from it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Bernardo. Thank Scott. you. Thank you. Thank you.